Dear respected brothers and elders, Alhamdulillah, we are only a number of weeks away now to the starting of Ramadan. So Ramadan is around the corner. And for us, Ramadan is a, is a month of the year wherein we're supposed to kind of uh, take time out and reconnect ourselves to the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen, to Islam. And if we're not doing that, then really one of the purpose of Ramadan, we're not meeting. So one of the gharz, the maqsad of the month of Ramadan is for you to reconnect back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we're, not conne- if we're not doing that, that means this month has passed, we haven't really achieved much. You know? So one of the reasons which we fast, right, there are a number of reasons, but well, one of them particularly is for us to gain taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what? That, يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The reason why we've made fasting incumbent upon you is so that you become God-fearing and pious. So that's why we fast. It's tough, it's got its challenges, but for us it's supposed to be a source of spiritual benefit and boost. Now check out this one. I was watching this thing just the other day about one motivational speaker. And what he does is he takes everybody to these resorts you know what resorts are? They're like holiday in campus, camps place, right? Where basically he gets everybody to come for like five days, seven days. And he gives them all this hump, pump, up motivation, motivation. And then he sends them back. And they're supposed to be after this one week, a renewed person again. So what then people will do, they're corporate people, executives, CEOs, big, big positions. And they will leave their jobs for a week and go there because in their mind, they're thinking, I need this to spiritually boost myself again. See, Allah is so kind, He gave us a free one every year, Ramadan. Allah Ta'ala gave us this, right? And this is, we're kind of, we, we, we look at things through the kind of, the, like the secular the lens. Or for example now, I, I would go as far as saying the Western lens, in the sense that everything's got to be corporate, everything's got to be money, everything's got to be big and so on. And I'll give you an example, right? So if, if, for example, someone said to you that there's this resort, you've got to go for 30 days. After that 30 days, you're going to feel like a new person. But you're going to have to give up work, you're going to have to give up family, it's just you and you've got to take full advantage of this and they're going to get you to do all these weird and wonderful things. People would think that that's a good, it's a good thing. There's this resort and I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change my whole life around. And people would go there and because people are thinking that they're getting something from it, mentally, that is already half the job done. I'll give you an example, I mean by half the job done. You know, for example, and I'll edit this hopefully, inshallah. (laughs) We've got relatives from Pakistan abroad, right? And they say to us, when you come, bring English paracetamols. English ones. And I'm like, bruv, it's a paracetamol. Whether you have it here or Islamabad or Rawalbindi Karachi, it's all the same. It's a paracetamol. The active ingredient is paracetamol. How can it be so different? And they say, not nah, English medicine, best. It's like, bro, are you really for real? The active ingredient is like, I studied in Pakistan as well. And I went to the pharmacy and they said, would you like a local medicine or an international one? I was like, what's the difference? They said, one tablet local, three rupees, international, 25 rupees. I said, bro, give me the local ones. I said, what's the active ingredient? They told me the active ingredient. I said, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll take this. It's an act I'm looking for the active ingredient in it, and that's all I'm looking for. And then someone says, no, the alphabet medicines aren't good, and people do milawad, and they mix things in there. And I'm like, it can't be that. Okay, I understand there's some fraud. I understand that, right? But this is a very reputable company. It's got a seal. It's okay. It, it'll be okay, inshallah. Okay? But check out this one. People fool themselves in thinking that they've got something good. They've got a good deal here. They think, yeah, I've got a good deal. Similar to the medicine, I'm eating English medicine, so I'm going to feel naturally better. And I'll give you another example, right? I went to my local, um, my shops, right? You know, free range eggs. I, I, I prefer to use free range eggs because it's an ethical issue. I don't think birds should be kept and squashed in cages. I, I think that's a bit cruel. So I personally go for free range. I would like to go for organic, but they're a bit costly, man. I eat three eggs a day. It's just my standard default. I love... If I don't eat an egg, I feel like I'm shaking like Pookie. I don't know if you know who that is, but I feel under it. So anyway, what happened was, right, is that my wife said to me, you have to get eggs, we've run out. So I went down to the local shops and they never had any. So I went to the local, this one vegetable shop and they sell eggs, okay? And uh, I, picked up, I picked up some. And what I did was is that they, these were normal ones, just normal eggs, normal standard, straightforward caged hen eggs. 
she cracked one and what she noticed that in the egg right there was a small red dot you know like, like a little blood piece a small red dot that's that can happen because they're eggs they're natural it's something that can happen so she went into a frenzy saying that you should have picked up the free range these aren't good um, they, you know, and I said okay fine what I did was I went to the shops again a second time I picked up the same eggs Wallah, I took my son with me I, took, I picked up the same eggs I came home and I put them in the free range dabba I changed the free range dabba okay I put them there and I said here here's the under she cracked one, she goes, Dick, yeah, and there. These are eggs. And I just said, Tika, and my son, he started laughing. I said, just, it's okay, leave it. A couple of, a few days after, my son mentioned, he goes, that, do you realize that these were normal? She goes, nay, medoni manti, kabi bini. She was in denial. Because it's all in the mind. When we think something, we've got, we're fixed on that. And that's, that's a personal example to home. Like this, there's other examples as well, that once we think something's from abroad, that's it. Immediately, we're more accepting of it. Similarly, is the case with our deen. It's exactly the same mentality. It's just a different way. When we think, for example, now Ramadan. Oh man, Ramadan, bro. I've got to go hungry. I've got to go starving. By, look, Allah's not stupid. Allah didn't send down stupid rules. He knew what was beneficial for us, and He knew that people would live in England. He knew people would live in South America, South Africa. He, all, Allah knew, and places are longer, shorter. He knew that people would have to fast. There's a reason for this. Scientifically, perhaps, I'm also going to say this as well. I had a really, really a deep conversation with one brother. And he was going through that how fasting and the benefits of fasting, and more so, the more hunger you feel, the more better it is for your mind, your mentality. It said nothing can stop Alzheimer's and dementia. I know this is a bit of a claim, and I'm not, I'm not saying I have the, 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 the evidence to back this up myself. It's on them to... Excuse me, it's on them to provide. But he said that the only thing that can, was it to halt it, to stop it, to stop the growth of it, is experiencing the similar symptoms like you do when you're fasting. So it has a mental benefit. And when you're not overeating, and it can also help people like, for example, who do like to overindulge, there's a physical benefit. But because we're always looking at it from a lens of people say, you're fasting, you must therefore be starving, you must therefore be hungry. Why would you fast? What's the benefit? What's the rationale? What's the wisdom? Look at this as a detox. We're supposed to be detoxing. Ramadan is not just about a psalm. Psalm means to imsak, it means to stop, withhold. Fasting is not merely just, for example, us just to go hungry. And I'm going to talk about this. The reason why I'm touching upon this subject now is because there's a whole preparation for this. Where we don't realize that there's only literally three and a half weeks left. Come, all of a sudden, Ramadan will be on our doorstep. And we haven't prepared for it. Now, me personally, right, how I prepare, I'm just sharing this with you. So you can maybe take a leaf from this. If you don't, it's fine. We all differ. Now, what I generally tend to do is that I generally make a list of all the things we generally need. Now, I know one thing in my house that gets used a lot in Ramadan, undoubtedly, is faluda, rose syrup. So, for example, now certain juices like this. I, as a, as a rule of always thumb, I do all my shopping beforehand. Besan, you know, to make pakori, they're not that's not going off for two, three months easily. So I buy all this, leave it. And then I know, right, I'm tension free for the month. Any small nitty gritty bits, I do and do and dust with. And then, for example, now, anything that needs to get done on the day, I pick up. So I need to get a little bit of this, sometimes this, sometimes some fresh fruit. Fine. It's not me going out on a mission every day trying to search and hunt for food. I mean, it's just a simple procedure. The reason why I do that is so then I can concentrate and focus more of my time in things, for example, like reading, recitation of Qur'an, spirituality. But if we don't even know that Ramadan is starting in approximately three and a half weeks, three to three and a half weeks, it's going to come to us like a, a smack in the face. We won't even be mentally, physically, or even anything even prepared for it. But like I said, I'm sticking on this point, right? Is that when people get told that there's this retreat, and if you were to go there and lo level, lock yourself off for a month, you're going to come back feeling like a new person, people would pay thousands and thousands of dollars. I know one guy who has this five-day program and he charges $5,000, a thousand pound a day, thousand uh, dollars a day, and people are happy to pay it because in their mind, they're thinking that after five days, I'm going to be a new person. If now, subhanAllah, like for example, because Allah gave us deen for free, sometimes we don't value it. 
And because deen is so easily accessible to everybody, wallah qasam, we don't have qadr, we don't have value for it. Because it's given so freely and easily, there seems like there's got to be a catch. Allah knew exactly what human beings needed for optimum health, mental, physical, spiritual. He knew and He made it an incumbent upon us. He's kind to us that He actually made us fast. It's actually His kindness that He said, do it. Otherwise, realistically, after, before, before Ramadan, until this Ramadan, how many days have you fasted? Ask yourself that question. Would we ever have fasted if we didn't have to do it? Personally, me, I doubt I would fast as much. Because I find it also challenging. But Allah Ta'ala knew that these people need a certain block away. And this is the, dow- the negative side. Because when as soon as we open our fast, we start smashing all kinds of manners of foods. We're actually doing sometimes more harm to ourselves as well. So there has to be a balance, okay? Now, mashallah, I know I, I spent some time with uh, some brothers, mashallah, more from the silat sides. And as soon as they would open up, and I think it's a general custom across all of Bangladesh, really, where people have like a dal, a very runny dal, with like rice, very light food. Unfortunately, Pakistanis are a bit more notorious. They open their roza with pakore and smosi and really heavy, oily foods. So I would say that, I mean, looking at how long we have to fast, this is definitely not a good idea. And rather we should be eating those things that are actually more nourishing for the human body and the human mind, body and soul. But look, my main purpose really is is to talk about just this much at this point in time, is that we, because we experience deen for free, sometimes we don't have the qadr and value for it. But this is the best time to spiritually connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What what is this going to make a difference in your life? I mean, compared to last year. Ramadan passed the one year before, the year before that, year before that. I'm in my 30s, so I've passed potentially how many Ramadans? Does it take me closer to Allah or am I constantly complaining? Look, Allah hasn't printed it on your forehead what you're going to get for fasting. But it doesn't mean it's going to be void of benefit. Just because you can't physically see the benefits right now, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's non-beneficial. It's non-tangible benefits you may see. You know, that feeling, subhanAllah, that, uh, of comfort, spirituality, that itself, peace of mind. People pay thousands of pounds to see someone to help them give them peace of mind. <coughs> you know when people come to see, I, I see clients, right? And they come to me because they feel depressed, they feel sad, and they sit there saying, I just hate myself, I just want to kill myself. I just want to throw myself in front of a train. And Bro, listen, you're going through turmoil, you get me? So you need to sit down, you need to open up, and you need to fix up, okay? So this is what Allah Ta'ala does, right? He gives us this kind of, these tools, these means, these methods that are for us that we can really slowly connect. Because when we connect to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, my understanding of being a Muslim is that every heart yearns for connection somewhere in some way. Allah has given us that in deen. Because when we have a connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the heart which yearns for connection is connected to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's the best connection. And this is what Allah mentions as well in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'in al qulub. That if you want to find real true peace, you'll find it only in the dhikr and the remembrance of Allah. So, what we do to fill our inner voids, we buy lots of cars, we buy houses, we invest in things, in money, we then buy expensive clothes, try to look good, seek approval, try to be the man. And then you find some people that are hollow inside, they're so shallow, they are so fragile. But when they speak to people, it's like, yeah, bruv, you're our bruv, and all this slang coming out. Take that person by their side and sit them down and they will crumble within five minutes because they also realize how fake they really are. So when we, are, when we have no connection to anyone or anything, the heart is vulnerable. So I believe, this is my understanding of being a Muslim, that when we connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your heart has found its purpose, it's connecting. It's co- it, there's, there's, you and, there's an intimate connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart which yearns connection, it has the best connection. And that's why Allah Ta'ala, one of the, I'm saying, look, one of the reasons is taqwa, and this is, uh, my purpose is not to focus just on Ramadan here, because that will, bayan will come, inshallah. It's about preparing for that. Now, Sha'ban is the month we're coming through. The 15th of Sha'ban is just around the corner. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned certain fadail and virtues about the 15th of Sha'ban. One of them is that for each and every one of us, is that every child that will be born, every child that will be born, every, any decision of rizq and sustenance for the coming year will be made on this particular night. Or Allah is already aware of it, but the angels are made aware that this person will die, this person will die, this person will die. This person will get this much rizq, this person will get this much rizq, this person will get this much rizq. These, the angels become aware of it on the 15th of Sha'aban, on that particular night, they become more aware. Alright? So that's coming, that's only just next week. So we're only just a couple of days away 
for us, we generally, right, in, I remember seeing this in broad, especially India, Pakistan, right? I haven't been in Bangladesh, so I can't comment, but I, I've been to these two countries and I saw, or in, in Sha'aban, people go all out. They start, like, what I find ironic, they start letting off fireworks, as if, I don't know what fireworks has got to do with Ramadan and Sha'aban, I really don't know. But these are just some bid'at and some innovations that have crept in. But the good, the best thing is to do is to kind of just ask Allah for afiyah. Make dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's a, a, a report, a riwayah, that he also, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to the grave and he made dua for the, for, the, for the dead and the deceased that passed away. These are part of, you can say, sunan, they're adab, mustahab, they're preferable to do. And if you can do it, all in good. But there are some hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions as well that there are some additional things, like Allah ta'ala, he makes an announcement and he says that, is there anybody, ala min mustaghfirin lah? Is there anyone that wants forgiveness? I'll forgive that individual. Is there anybody that is seeking rizq, sustenance? They want some form of sustenance, I'll give them that sustenance. Is there anybody that is going through difficulty, afflicted, a pain, they're suffering? Ask me and I'll alleviate you of your pain and your difficulty. And this happens and happens and happens until the Salat al-Fajr in the morning. Now obviously there's some questions, there's some kalam in this sanad and it's not kalam free so to say. But I'm saying that there's two extremes. One extreme is that where people go all out, have taqreers and waz all night long. I, I make it like a, like a constant thing. And then there's one people that say, no, this is absolutely a complete bid'ah and a haram. So there's a middle path between the two. So the middle path is that we can engage in some form of ibadah, engage in something, but ultimately remembering that the Prophet didn't fix nothing in particular. The most we can do is go make dua like he وسلم, did at the certain graves and so on. If you can do that, all and good. And if you can't, find fair enough. Just engage yourself in something beneficial, but not something which is harm, harmful or impermissible. But like I said, this month is the prelude, the, pre, the sort of the preface, the introduction for Ramadan to start. And for that reason, Ramadan is something you're going to have to pair, prepare in advance for. Buy your things you need, get things done. Some of you, mashallah, because you're working in a hotel environment, uh, kind of a food environment, your food may come from there, fair enough, but you've got families. Try to encourage them as well. Okay, use your time the best way. Utilize it in the best way. The biggest challenge we have, obviously living in UK, is that Ramadan is not a public holiday. <laughs> nor is Eid. So Ramadan for us is a challenge because we have our work, we have college, we have our study, and with that, we have the fasting. We shouldn't, re our productivity shouldn't drop in any way, shape or form. We should push ourselves and give it our best and strive to the best. Because if our faith becomes a block in what we do, then people will say, you see, there's no benefit in fasting. It's actually harmful. And we only serve the bigger purpose for people to think that Islam is backwards. Rather, my productivity should be exactly the same. I should strive my best and do exactly the same. If you're doing a job, do exactly the same work which you do. If you're a teacher, teach the same way. If you're working in a factory, work the same way. If, if you physically, you physically cannot manage it, you cannot, there's no question about it, it is going to have a detriment to your health, then for you on that particular day, there would be permissibility for you not to fast. It is, it's not an endurance test. Allah's not trying to push us to the limits and trying to see how much he can, a person can take before they crack. But he wants to see at least some connection between us and him. If then we every day look at this as a spiritual detox, if I if I just if the only thing I'm doing is going hungry from dawn till dusk, right? Or the other way around from dusk and is it no one second? Sunset. Alright, let's use from dawn, yeah. From morning till evening, chalo. If the only thing I'm doing is keeping hungry, well what was the point in that? What was the Okay, you would have ticked it off the list to say, Alhamdulillah, I fasted. Alhamdulillah, I prayed salah. Alhamdulillah, I've done my hajj. Alhamdulillah. But there's a connection there. There's supposed to be, what are you supposed to get out of this? It's supposed to be for you to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For you after that month to really have an intimate, deep connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A spiritual one. One with your deen. One where the mentality should be is that I need to eat and drink to survive, but I'm ready to sacrifice that for my Allah. If I'm ready to sacrifice this, then of course I can sacrifice the drugs, I can sacrifice the haram, I can sacrifice the women, I can sacrifice the zina, I can sacrifice the gambling and the fraud and all that. If I can do the things which I cannot survive without, then naturally I can survive without this. That's also another bigger picture, but we'll address this inshallah. Allah give us tawfiq and the ability to practice, make amal, and inspire one and all, and take this message unto others. Wa akhir da'wana. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.